All right, let's get into it because the hour is late, especially for our European friends, and uh, there's a lot to talk about. Um, we're going to go. We, anyone calling from the other side of the pond gets to go first in line because, uh, in deference to the in deference to uh, in deference to the hour. So obviously, um, a lot happened. And as the saying goes, what's I think it was Stan Weinstein coined the phrase. What's interesting is not the news, but it's the reaction to the news. Market just hasn't been listening. Hasn't been listening to uh, the Fed. Certainly haven't been listening to these rooms. But now it would seem as if reality is setting in. The Fed's got their throat foot on the throat of the market, and they're going to have their way. And I don't want to engage in Captain Obvious stuff, so I want to go to maybe stuff which is a little second order of thinking. Not that it's so brilliant, but um, as we were discussing, I think in the last in spaces, we did what, five spaces in eight days last week. I think. If the market were to break, this is a particularly vulnerable time of the year. 2022 has been an Anis Horribilis. Many firms have closed their books for the year. Someone said it, I can't remember who it was. Anyone who's got access to risk capital is not going to put it up on the line here in the, in the back half of December. So, you know, when the selling starts, there's nobody on the other side of it. And you get the keyboard monkeys, the vol targeting funds, the risk parity guys, the CTAs, the Mo guys. They're buying it for one reason and one reason only, because number go up and volatility come down. And now number to no go up no more. So I'm sure we all read the same stuff. I mean, I'm teensily in the cell because, you know, if it breaks this level and that level. But let's get push all the technical side stuff aside. It's not really what this is about. Most clear-minded uh, observers of the scene, and, and again, look at, just look at this room. I mean, just look at this room. Look at the people we have in this room. This is this is this is the. It's without. It's just extraordinary. I mean, not only is this the best fintwit room, this is better than any investment conference I could ever go to. It's just remarkable. So I want to thank all of you. But getting to the fundamentals, I mean. You know, it, 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 I don't know where to begin because I look around. There's so many friends here. So many guys have been right here. And so I want to turn to an echo chamber. The Bulls are always welcome to come in. I mean, we're very nice to them. We had we had uh, Barry Ritholtz in here the other day. Nice guy. I don't agree with him, but nice guy. Anyway, uh, we had Jared Dillian in here, you know, a couple months ago. He made a great tactical call. We'll see how long that, long that stays. And by the way, that gets to one point on Twitter, which I think causes a lot of disconnects. It's multiple time frames. Some folks are day traders. Some folks are trying to get the quarterly thing right. Some folks are trying to get you know annual thing right. And there's so much misunderstanding and, 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 and mudslinging based on time frames. And people want to play the scoreboard game. I mean, seriously, they want to give Thornton a hard time because he got a call right. Forget about the fact he's at 45 percent this year. Or they want to go after Cantro because he's been right as rain, and for six weeks he looks stupid because you know people are believing in fantasies. Like, come on. Or Ian, I mean, I could any one of you. It's all the same thing. These are whatever. That's not the point. So let's go back. to So where are we? Forget about what has happened. Let's talk about what's going to happen. Where are we? I think truths we hold to be self-evident. Growth is slowing. Earnings estimates are too high. Street's complacent about that. You know, whether S and P earnings, I think two hundred would be a win for twenty twenty three if they came in at that number. You don't have to believe in Michael Belkin's two hundred and twenty dollars, but you know, a lot of folks out there. I mean, Cantro, your your colleague Nancy Lazar, I think, is at with one eighty or one ninety, and Ian, I think you're in a similar type of ballpark. So let's just be nice about. It. Let's say it's two hundred dollars for next year. I think it's too high. The market at thirty eight, thirty nine hundred, going into an economic downturn, volatility picking up, and credit spreads widening, widening, and P's contracting. Like that doesn't work. By the way. It's hysterical. I know I tweeted this out. We talked about this the other day. It's just like all the talk all year long about the Fed this, the Fed that, we're going to reduce the balance sheet, blah, 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 blah. It was only like a week ago. We're on a 12-month year, you know, rate of change basis year on year. The Fed balance sheet contracted for the first time since 2019. Because, you know, they were they were buying mortgage-backed securities into the face of the freaking biggest housing bubble ever. And at the same time, you get Janet Yellen over at the Treasury you know, push following some money in there. So, you know, it's trust but verify. You know, they, they talk to talk. They don't walk to walk. 
And, you know, this transitory crowd, they're completely full of crap. Then they were saying inflation's peaking. They were full of crap. Finally, inflation did peak. That idea inflation's coming down is not the issue. The issue is how fast will it come down, what trajectory. And it's the same crowd's now saying it's going to be 2% six months from now or nine months from now. When way it's going to be that if we get a freaking depression. That ain't good for the market either. At any rate, valuations are high. Estimates are too high. Public participation, you know, they bought and they never sold. Okay, now they're selling for the first time the last few weeks. How's that working out for you? It's also kind of interesting. Look at within the market. I'm going to embarrass Cantro because he's been so articulate on this point. You want to stay away from the far ends of the, from the end zones. You don't want to own the crazy Cappy stuff. Narrative-driven cash flow, negative, bad balance sheet companies. And you also don't want to own the value traps at the other end. Would-be bust airlines or leverage balance sheets exposed to a declining consumer. You want to be in the middle. At any rate, put it all together. I mean, you know, I think I coined the phrase a year ago. It's still true. Equities represent return-free risk. Return-free risk. You don't want to go short? Fine, I get it. Short's for crazy people like myself. But you got no business being long. Don't come crying to me if you lose money. And the problem is the, 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 the investment buy has been so ill-served by the street. You know, from CNBC to Kramer to Kathy Wood to Bulge Bracket Firms, Fidelity, Vanguard, you know, <laughs> sell is a four-letter word. Sell is a four-letter word. And I love the excuses that they give for it. You know, one, you shouldn't sell because if you sell, you then get to present a problem. You got to figure out when to get back in. Or, you know, you shouldn't sell because stocks go up, you know, 9% a year for the last 100 years. So... You think you're smarter than the market? You can't market time. I'm gonna I'm gonna trigger Brigden. I want him to get in here and talk about market timing. Or you shouldn't sell because you're gonna to have to pay taxes. Well, that's assuming you have any taxes and you have any taxable gains left. Well, you shouldn't sell. This is my favorite one. It's gonna upset your asset allocation mix. Like seriously. So what I would say to the average person in the room is, if you find the market's bothering you, if it's interfering with your sleep. I think it was the Rothschilds. I get confused with this. I'm tired. I'm actually in Aruba. I'm supposed to be on vacation, but as my former boss, Mr. Lynch, used to say, Mr. Market, knows no one doesn't care what your schedule is. So um, vacation, you know, was supposed to start at 8 a.m. this morning, but then I postponed it to 4 p.m., and then I'm talking to him, and it's like, all right, let's do a space. So just in terms of how this is going to roll, I'm on here probably for an hour. I'll, I'll be on till let's see, it's five Eastern. I'll be on till like maybe six thirty, and then I gotta get out of here. I'm gonna leave it in the capable hands of Emma, uh, ALB, uh, Wall Street Silver, etc. So, at any rate, um, I think I think uh, they always say about forecasts: give people a, a price, give them a, give them a date, but never give them the two at the same time. I think there are reasons to think we have a confluence of events. There are reasons to think that it's right here, right now. The bears got squeezed the last two. The bears got squeezed the last two months. That's now over. You know there was that chart floating around um, uh, a couple of weeks ago, showing how, how showing how the VIX, um, you know, had, had, had wanders up, wanders down, in inverse fashion proportion to the market. And as of like a week ago, the market's on the roof and the VIX is in the, is in the toilet. Now, wa- now it's time to trade trade places. Watch rinse repeat. So. I'm going to say right here, right now, I think this decline, I'm going to be hyperbolic. You can pay me, I can pay me later. I'm not saying it's going to crash tomorrow. But, you know, whether it goes down 10% in one day or it goes down 10% in two months, who cares? You get to the same place. We are going significantly lower. And maybe people may be anchored off of the price from you know, three days ago saying, oh, my God, look how much the market's gone down. It just got started. Look at where prices are compared to where they were, you know, in the middle of October. Now, if you're looking at some of the real garbage, and I'm not here to pump my ETF, but you can look at my ETF, the crap I'm trafficking in, again, it's not investment advice, that stuff can't get off the bottom. So it's making new lows. The electric car company that shall not be named is 20% lower than it was in the middle of October. So the market's starting to differentiate between the stuff Cantrell likes and the stuff Cantrell doesn't like. All right, enough of that. Um, I got plenty more to say. You guys know I'm not shy about talking. I want to get this going in rapid fire fashion. So again, as I said, in deference to those who are um, geographically uh, advanced, 
meaning they're five hours ahead of us. I'm going to start with uh, our good friend, uh, Ian Harnett. Ian, I'm really glad you've been making the time. Um, you, you've been spot on. And again, I like to tell people, as opposed to yours truly, you're actually what they call a normie. You're not a financial pervert. <laughs> you, you're, not, you're not a financial pervert. Um, you are a responsible person. You're actually a nice guy. Uh, and, so, and so when you came out as bearish as you did earlier this year, there's serious information content in that. So, Ian, maybe a good way to start would be just, you know, go back to why you turned negative, how, what's changed over the last few months. I think it's fair to say, truth be told, probably the economic news hasn't been quite as bad as we thought it would be. But that doesn't, actually, that's a negative, not a positive, but leave that aside. But why did you turn negative earlier in the year and what's changed and, and, and what, are your, what, are your, what are your strongest convictions right now? Ian, take it away. Well, George, thanks very much, and thank you, everybody, and them to uh, inviting me on to, to speak, um, particularly on this day that's uh, such a potentially important one. I think the key thing, George, is just recognizing that we have now seen the broadest, the fastest, and the largest rate rise across developed economies in the last 40 years. Um and we are still seeing policymakers today raising rates into an economic downturn. And as you say, you know, if you're starting from valuations, which are still ridiculously high, you know, if we're looking at valuations, which if you take uh, the equity market or equity earnings down to the type of declines you've seen in the average recession of the last 40 years, then you are talking about the S&P still being on 22 times, 23 times against a historic average of something like 15 and a half. Um, and even the Eurozone that's supposed to be the really cheap place is on 18 times trough earnings uh, that we would predict at least. So, you know, we're just not looking at markets that are cheap. But at the same time, I think the things that we are really concerned about, George, is this belief from central banks that you know, quantitative tightening is just a technical adjustment as we as we drain liquidity from the system. Um, a chart that I'm going to put up on Twitter at the weekend, I tend to, to try not to put out too much during the week, but at the weekend, um, the reward for everybody is a chart that shows that since the start of QE, central banks added the equivalent of 20 percent of global GDP. But on the other axis is non-financial debt as a percent of GDP across the world. That went from 180% of GDP to 260%. And it goes on a one-for-one -one basis. Central banks have delivered a four times levered injection of debt into the global economy on the way up. And despite what Janet Yellen said about watching paint dry, uh, when she tried to do QT last time, that caused a squeeze. And it's doing it the same. We've seen $4 trillion of central bank liquidity come out over the last year. And that is going in dollar terms. And that is going to squeeze $16 trillion out of non-financial debt. That is going to be a big hole in the real economy. And I think that's the thing that we're just pointing out, which is that the Fed does not is never going to cut rates just because inflation is coming down. They only ever pivot for two reasons. Unemployment's going through the roof or there's a financial crisis. We think it's going to be the latter. And that's the reason why the average Fed pivot de delivers a decline for equities relative to bonds. We've had 12 of them in the last 50 years. A median decline of 28%. The worst was 65%. And only 1995 did you not see um, equities going down. So, you know, the, sometimes it takes three years for the, for the full workout after that pivot. Like 1987, sometimes it takes three days. But, you know, the bottom line is that the pivot is not going to be your friend. And we just don't want to own risk assets, George, until you get to the bottom. But I think my last point, and then, you know, actually second to last point, is is – you, you actually hit it on the head about your comment about timeframes. I think there's a whole generation of investors that believe that time is your friend in the market. They're brought up on Jeremy Siegel's stocks for the long run. That was written in 1985 when the Schiller PE was at 15. At 15, your prospective uh, 
returns over the next decade were 15% per annum. It paid to hold stocks for the long run. It paid to buy the dips. Starting at 28 times, which is where we are on Shiller PEs today, your prospective return is 3 to 5%. And it just doesn't pay to hold for the long run. You know, it is, this is a time to be out of equities. Equities are the most expensive relative to bonds. When you detrend those, you're using 100 year of data, using 10 year detrending. This is as, as expensive almost as it was in 1929. It's certainly the most expensive it's been since 2000. This, I think, is a generational opportunity to switch out of equities towards bonds. And so my last point, George, would be to say, as I mentioned in the email I spent, sent to you before this, the thing that's really fascinated me this, this year is you know, that we are down 16 17% um, on the S&P this year already. And yet we've been talking, people have been talking as though this has been a bull market these last couple of months. And, you know, what we're seeing is that there's a fundamental drag. That's what a lot of us are talking about here. But they've always been technical rallies. We've been bouncing off the 200 week moving average. And then we've been selling down at the 200 day moving average. You know, follow the fundamentals. That's what's going to keep you solvent in the long run. And, you know, you can be a day trader, but, you know, then just play the sentiment game. But the fundamentals here, I think, are still very, very negative. And I would agree with you. Our central forecast is certainly 3,200. You know, that's a very simple, simple arithmetic. 200 on the EPS, 16 times forward. Um, and that gives you 3,200. The big support's at 2,900. Um, and, um, you know, I think we're going to see that at some stage uh, in the next 12 months. So we're still very definitely max underweight equities, max overweight cash, whatever that means for you in your personal portfolio. So, Ian, that's brilliant. Thanks so much for that it's a question. When everyone has a thesis on an idea, it could be an individual stock idea, a macro idea, whatever, you're, you, know, you, 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 you commit, put pen to paper, you push the ball back and forth, you think about it, draw a line down the middle page, you know, on the one hand, on the other hand, you finally say, okay, this is, this is where I think it's going to go. But yep. then what's interesting is once you put the position on, you watch how markets behave, you have afterthoughts, you gain incremental pieces of information. So your opinion may start to evolve a little bit. You may have even more conviction about your opinion. There may be some things you didn't quite appreciate at the outset. Or some things may give you pause. How has your view or your conviction level changed over the last few months since you've adopted this, this viewpoint earlier this year? I, I, I think it's... Yeah, sorry. sorry go, ahead. Go, no, go ahead. Go ahead. Go ahead. You know, I, I think it's firmed. I think it's firmed up. You know, because what we are seeing, you know, what, what we're talking about is, is what we're describing as quantitative destruction. The systematic unwinding of the institutional structures that have been created in a decade of zero interest rates and easy liquidity. And, you know, we're just seeing this, you know, systematically, it's like the shark tank. You are taking out the weakest link, whether that's FTX, whether it's Credit Suisse, whether it's the buy now, pay later stocks, whether it's Frocket Financial, whether it's UK 30 year gilts. Who would have thought that? You know, but you are gradually, you know, taking out the the bits that have really, you know, done supremely well because interest rates were at zero. But there's a whole generation, you know, even, you know, including people like yourself and myself, George, who've been around these markets 30, 40 years who have not seen this scale of monetary tightening um, uh, since that 1979-80 time period. And if you look at 100 years of drawdown in U.S. Treasury returns, you've not seen anything like what we've seen this year. So, you know, I think I, I've become more convinced that this is a complete train wreck for risk assets. Sorry, that's a personal view, and it's not investment advice. It, it, I've joined George on the dark side there. Ian, I always knew you had it in you. <laughs> <laughs> by the way, by the, I have to ask you, um, you're, uh, uh, you're, you're a terrific partner, Mr. Bowers. And for those of you who have not, don't know Dave, David Bowers um, 
Oh my God, I've known Ian. I've known David longer. I've known David longer than yeah. it Goes back to Smith Newcourt days in the eighties. David Bowers, for those of you, if the name doesn't mean anything, was uh, formerly the global uh, investment strategist uh, for Merrill Lynch. Co-founded ASR with uh, Ian. If you're interested in what Ian has to say, I suggest you reach out to him and, and you know maybe take a trial service with him. I'm just curious, um, Ian. Um, David, who's a, you know a really solid thinker, um, this, is is he pretty much on the same page as you? How would he? Da- if we had David, if we had David, in, if you could drag David into one of these spaces, what would he say? He'd actually give you a major rant about the iniquity and the failure of of, of central banking in the world of QE, um, and you know he is very uh, very much on the same page. And you know we've actually just hired the ex. Uh, Chief European Equity Strategist from UBS, Nick Nelson, who has joined us, um, and you know, you know, he he's joined from the dark side, and he is also on this page. And echoing what you were saying about equities, you know, wanting to avoid, you know, the um, excess leverage, excess financial leverage, excess operating leverage. Yeah, David Wood um, is very concerned, George, about the uh, the level of um, excess liquidity and how this gets reduced over time and the consequences of that. But his particular interest, and George knows that David has been focused on Japan for many, many decades, is the change in behavior to global asset prices that we'll see when we see the BOJ back out away from QQQ. So we're all focused on the Fed and the ECB today. But you know, next year, it'll actually be the BOJ that unsettles markets as we start to see the, um, the easy liquidity that was provided by Japanese savers being withdrawn and taken back to Japan and the yen rally, JGB sell off. But actually, the push through into things like U.S. credit could be really quite severe. So, yeah, David's um, very concerned about these liquidity issues and just thinks it's ridiculous that triple A credit has lost more money than triple C this year. It's yeah, it's funny. I was chuckling to myself when you were saying that. It's like those on those television commercials, and they say, "Wait, and there's more." <laughs> <laughs> oh, there's lots oh more, my, George. Oh you know Lord. that. <laughs> oh my lord! Oh my lord! Ian, we why did you? Just... We got twenty thousand macro to market charts, so there's plenty more, George. Yeah, but the no. interesting thing, the interesting thing at the moment is that so many of our charts don't stop with equities down 20 percent. They show equities underperforming bonds or equities in absolute terms going down more. That chart I talked about, about equity versus bond relative valuations, the typical decline over the next five years is somewhere between 25 percent and 75 percent. This is the scale of the thing that we're talking about. And I think well, that's you, the thing that really worries me. Yeah, so Ian, Ian, Ian all right, let's go for it now. Let's go for the throat. Um, <laughs> so there's price and there's time. We, we talked about time a little bit earlier. Yeah. So the idea that in this cycle, because of the extraordinary um, excess we had on both the fiscal and the monetary side, the idea that in this cycle, okay, the Fed will blink at some point, sure, but you're not going to see you know, massive liquidity, massive fiscal injections, such as we've seen over the last couple of decades. So that number go up, you know, again, quickly. In other words, yeah, they'll, they'll ease to, you know, stop the world from playing. I get all that. All right. But the idea yeah. I mean, has is, is this works. You've been at this long enough. You have a whole generation of investors who, you know, BF Skinner, please call your office, you know, you know for, for a flight from pain, you know, it's, 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 it's fleeting, right? The pain, right? The, the, the central banksters have, have made it so that any pain was temporary. But what if I told you, what, what if the, but, but, but you know, focus on the concept of time that, yeah. you know, it doesn't have to be down 70%. Let's say we're just down 30% or 40%. But you know what, Ian? It doesn't come back. It'll be this sort of Japanesque type of fiasco. And, and someone said, you know, a few, a few months ago in one of these spaces, time kills more people than price. What would you say to that? Yeah. No, I think that I think that is certainly one concern that, you know, when you get this kind of shock and that's why the chart about the drawdown in treasuries is so important, because the Fed, this is a rupture in the monetary regime that we've had over the last decade. 
in the last four decades, actually, um, but certainly the last two decades. And the Fed has shown you they don't have an equity put. They've shown you now that they don't have a bond put, but they probably will have a credit put. But, you know, that that volatility in treasury returns really will make it very tricky, I think, George, to put the genie back in the bottle in terms of, um, you know, people wanting to to to, to fund um, government debt at, you know, super low prices or super high prices, you know, uh, super low yields um, in a world unless there is very, very weak activity indeed. Um, so I would, I, as, as you know, you should never say never in this game. I, I, I do worry that we will just get a big, you know, one of the charts we got is look at the NAHB, the housing market in the States, the decline in the NHA, NAHB index over the last 12 months has historically fitted very well with a good change in the uh, Fed funds rate. Guess what it's predicting for Fed funds 18 months out? Please do tell. Zero. You know, it would, it would be consistent. The scale of fall that we've seen would be consistent with a 400 basis point decline in Fed funds rates historically. So, you know, you, the, the idea that if there is enough of a shock that we will actually then the Fed will be forced to capitulate. And it's not until the Fed does capitulate that you end up with bear markets reversing. Um, and that's been true over the last 40 years and, you know, true of the last 50 years as well. But then, you know, we will, I, I, I am afraid, you know, a bit like David, David hopes that this won't be the case. I, I suspect that we may actually see QE again in the same way we did briefly in the UK following the, um, the, the, the LDI crisis um, uh, uh, earlier this year. Right. Fair yeah. Enough. I'm I'm very worried about that as well, and and um, so I think like everybody should be cautious heading into April of 2023 because it, no matter which way they go, I mean, if they expand, if if they're not going to hold the the JGB rate at 25 basis points, instead they say, oh, let's make the range 50, 75. Well, the duration on the on the BOJ's balance sheet and the GPIF's balance sheet and all those life insurers balance sheets that own all those treasuries are going to the the duration is going to take a huge hit to their portfolios and you're just going to see sovereign bond yields like go up all over and things kind of go haywire. So I, I mean, I, I get really like, I don't really, I'd probably rather play like if, if I was trying to like short again, I would be like long a treasury instead. <laughs> uh, 100%. All right. So let's, so let's move on. So Ian, this is fabulous. Please hang around as long as you can. I know it's getting late there. We'll do. But let's, but let's keep the room going. I'd like to go to uh, my friend, the Carter. Um, he is uh, one of the sharpest uh, guys out there. Brilliant job throughout the year, calling every move of the Fed. Got screwed up like I did a month or two ago. Couldn't freaking understand what the hell Powell was up to. But uh, he's, you know, we don't get him all right. But he, he, he's really, really one of the most expert Fed watchers that I know of. And uh, so, Carter, really good to see you. The floor is yours. Please go for it. George, thank you. That's uh, that's way too kind. <clears throat> You're right. I have been messed up over the last couple of months. I was thrown off by Powell at uh, at Brookings. Um, but I think I think this these last 24 hours were one of those one of those big moments that we'll look back here uh, a year from now. Um, I've been laser focused since July on the Fed not repeating the stop and go policy mistake of the Burns Fed in the 1970s. And once they started communicating that on mass, I I got very very bearish and I think I think this Fed meeting was the first step. It was the first step in in proving to the market that they will not be the Burns Fed. But what that means for the market, I don't think I really don't think the market understands. I don't think many market participants understand. And I work in I work at an investment advisor in the market twenty four seven. People do not understand what that means. Um, so if you go back, if you go back to the early seventies, go back to the late sixties. Core. I realize there are differences in inflation between then and now, uh, but just directionally, 
core CPI broke out over 6% in the late 60s. Fed raised rates, took the economy into a recession, and you got core CPI down to that 2 to 3% level in the early 70s. And on a, the economy had weakened, so the Fed backed off and let the economy come back. There is, and I tweeted about this after Powell, there is not a single member of, the, of this M- FOMC that would have not done what Burns did. Every single one of them would have done what Burns did. They only know not to be Burns with the benefit of hindsight, which is really scary because even if we're going into a really bad economic contraction like Cantro's, um, Cantro's analysis would sort of lead you to believe, they're not going to back off. They're, they, they're not going to cut rates because they, that's what Burns did. So they had an opportunity. They had an opportunity to start to back off at this FOMC meeting with that second soft inflation print in a row. I, I, George and I talked before the, before the, uh, before the meeting and I thought they were going to back off. I thought they were going to get weak. I am shocked that they actually took the opportunity in the face of two soft prints in a row to actually take the terminal rate up to five. And they have been and all the commentary has been laser focused on getting financial conditions tight. So, I don't see how this market, how we get out of this without being down 50%. Um, Ian says 3,200. Uh, that seems really gen- very generous. I, I don't see how we don't get out of this with the market, with the market above 2,500. I don't know if it's sometime in 23 or if it's in 24, but um, I agree with George. It uh, Everything lines up. This next leg down, everything is, everything lines up. And I would be, I am personally max short, uh, max short stocks until maybe we'll reassess when the percent of stocks over their 50 day moving average gets down below 10% where you get really oversold. Uh, right now, that percent I think is over 60% at this point. Um, so record yield curve inversion with the market failing at the 200 day, Powell takes the first opportunity to prove he's not Burns. I think everything lines up for a really, really nasty next four to 12 weeks. Yep. Okay. Wax Circus has been holding his hand very patiently for a long time. Are you, are you there? Can you unmute yourself? Hey, thanks so much. I uh, really appreciate um, being given the chance to ask some questions. So um, listening to the conversation um, and I guess whoever wants to be a taker, um, Ian or uh, the gentleman that was just speaking or you, Emma, I'm sort of curious what you guys think about the debt complex of the world of the U.S. government combined with overall demographic trends, combined with what everyone would sort of have characterized for a long time as uh, secular deflationary tech trends um, and how it's possible in the face of all of those sort of very large scale forces for rates to remain high in the medium or long term. And when I say medium or long term, I mean like, you know, even to 2024. Um, so curious for for the group's reaction to, to sort of that line of, of counter argument. I think George George has an answer that um, so I'll let him go first. Yeah, all right, I'll, I'll go first, and I want Ian to speak, and and I want to get off this topic because I don't think this is real. It's a good topic, but it's not what's front and center. It, it, it's not the kernel of the issue we're trying to deal with today. It's a great topic, but for another room, I'll answer it quickly, and then I want Ian to answer it. And, and, I, and I'd like to go to a different topic if you don't mind. Don't mean to be rude. I just want to stay on the thread that we were on. Yeah, no problem. Um, yeah, yeah, it is a problem. Let's just deal with the U.S. Thirty-one trillion of debt. I think the average term of the debt is four or five years. There are these charts floating around. Fintwit. I tweeted one out the other day. It shows you know if you just roll forward and shows what happens to interest expenses as a percentage of the government uh, budget. It goes through the roof. No surprise there. But with the average term of four or five years, you know, if, if I think the U.S. government paid I think it was one point two percent average interest rate last year. So you just can't blink and say, well, take it from one to five in 12 months. It doesn't work that way. Um, so, yes, it's going to be a, be a big drag. Um, and it kind of reminds me of Stein's Law, um, you know, 
that which can't go on won't. Um, and but it also brings forward in my mind, we'll go back to something Ian was talking before about the LDI problem and, and, and the issue we have with, with, with the guilt market in the UK. It's not a sustainable course. It's just not. And at some point, um, the market's going to, you know, the, the market's going to attack. So it's a huge long-term problem. But right here, right now, today, in terms of why the market's likely to, you know, decline significantly, in my opinion, again, not investment advice in the next few months. And Ian, because he's a nice guy, I mean, he didn't want to scare all the, you know, scare all the women and children. He said 3,200. So I know we're 2,500 by 3,200. Cars are 2,500. Ian's at 3,200. Let's split the difference. Doesn't matter. I mean, Jesus Christ. Can you imagine what Tesla's going to be even if we stop at 3,200? I mean, to the point you raise is a good one. It's just not the issue for today. Ian, over to you. You something you want to chime in? Yeah, on that it's question? just very, very quickly, George. You know, the alter, You know, the, the reality is that that is high. You know, what what the central banks are trying to do is to deliver debt to deflation. You know, by doing quantitative tightening. Um, but you know, longer term, it's actually easier to inflate your way out of the debt problem by you know money illusion with higher nominal growth. We've got three charts that we focus on that actually that that uh, labor share. Um, you know, the working population is going to be coming down, not going up globally. Secondly, if you look at the big driver of the deflationary trends, it was access to cheap Chinese goods and labor. You know, that's going to be less clear with reshoring. And thirdly, ESG and the reshaping of the energy nexus is going to be expensive. So short term, cyclical inflation you know, comes down longer term. You know, it's harder to keep it down, um, partly because, you know, it's it's a it's an easier way of, of, of removing that debt in the long run as a percent of GDP. Great, Ian. Emma, who's next? Emma, go for it. Who, who hasn't spoken? Let's go to uh, John Butler. You got a quick question, John? <laughs> Hey guys, um, it's John here from the UK. Uh, it's a question for Ian, really. Um, recently, I've uh, been watching a lot of YouTube, kind of trying to get me around everything. Uh, George Gammons recently put up a video re- regarding the Federal Reserve, um, and he's saying basically it could be on the brink brink of bankruptcy. I'm just kind of kind of want to get your views on it, really. You know, you know, probably the uh, the the BOJ is closer to that point, I suspect. But um, it, yes, it's not clear. You know, there was actually a, a, a piece by Willem Voiter about fifteen years ago on on the bankruptcy of central banks. It's hard to actually deliver that. They are backstopped by their governments, and the governments can issue debt and re they can just recapitalize the the central banks. You know, so I I wouldn't be too worried about it. the question is whether the Federal Reserve is lo- going to lose its credibility. And at that point, the dollar collapses. Um, you know, that's probably some some distance away yet. Uh, but, you know, uh, as you know, the previous uh, speaker was saying, you know, that the, what is seems to be clear is that the central bankers are determined to push through this continued rate rise. And, you know, that that is the, the and, and driving that into the economic into an economic slowdown like this is going to be dangerous. But, you know, yeah, they've got they hold a lot of this debt. Um, uh, and, you know, it's going to be very difficult to engineer their way out of it. They've tried it once in 2019 with QT. Then they're going to try it again now with QT. They're probably going to fail once again. Um, but, yeah, I wouldn't take it, you know, I wouldn't take those kind of, of concerns that uh, seriously. As I say, you know, more likely we'll end up with the, uh, the, the new Nippon Bank of Japan as it gets recapitalized and they write off the uh, some of the debt given they own so much of it. This is a big uh, jubilee, right? Yeah. Yes, Emma. Yeah. That's great. All right. Let's go to uh, let's go to Gnostic. Hey, Gnostic. What's going on? Hey there. Uh, I'm Ian. I really appreciate you coming in, and I appreciate what you get to say. It, it's a Thank somewhat you, refreshing viewpoint. Uh, but I have a question for you. In through all of this, and through several spaces I've been in recently, uh, it's the duration that seems to be the issue. The Fed came in late to sit down and do its work. Uh, and I think everybody realizes they came in late, and that's what screwed up everybody, including me. Um, and the the issue in there now becomes duration. How long, and, and what the last questioner just did, again, has to do with the duration and the attitude of the Fed to, we will not do a Burns again, uh, is, I think, a little pedantic on the on the pressure side of how long they're going to do this. 
So the question of duration raises its, its head rather than um, actual effect. And do you think that the duration the Fed feels is going to be necessary to do this is actually a factor in there? Or will they actually look at some of the statistics, which as we've seen in multiple spaces are, are open to question right now as to whether they're still valid or not. So, and even in the last speech that Powell gave, he did the, this the, at the uh, Institute that he was uh, lecturing at, uh, he did kind of question the statistics themselves and mentioned something I found very disturbing, which was they're going to, they're going to adjust rates by feel when they feel it's right. And that sort of raised my doubt as to when, you know, are the statistics accurate? Is this going to be well? Is this going to be a duration? Or is this going to be a, an emotional response to sit down and say we have to maintain our credibility? And are any of those, is, are any of those points even relevant? Or would they actually follow the, the process and at least get out before they successfully crush everything? Or are they bent for sure to sit down and destroy enough capital uh, that they actually reduce stuff and create a, a high enough infl leave a high enough inflation rate there that it actually does away with the debt. So I, I, that may be a little bit of a confusing confusing question, but I think you understand no, where it's going. No, I, I understand where, where you're going with that. So I think that the, there's a, a few strands to this. Obviously, first of all, that I think that what's you know our, my understanding of what uh, Powell has consistently been saying, and also Brainard as well, is that they are determined to create excess capacity to bring core inflation down. And they will do whatever ta it takes for as long as it takes. So they are prepared to play the long duration game on those interest rates. And they are prepared to go as high as is necessary. Um, they, are they are clearly just pausing to a degree, um, but that's not the same as pivoting. My belief is that they will only pivot when something does break. Um, and that's either the employment market, the labor market clearly breaks aggressively. And we're already seeing 44 states that have unemployment going up in the last month. 37 states have seen unemployment go up in the last three months. We get the state data tomorrow. We'll be doing the same analysis again then. But you know, the, 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 the simple um, answer is that actually, if you look at the pivots, and one of the, the lines we've been using with our clients is that Six out of those 12 pivots took place in June, uh, sorry, July. Just the, It's the last Fed meeting before the summer break. At that point, they have to take a tough decision. Do they leave it on hold over the summer or do they make some changes? So I think that they will be aiming to at least keep rates um, on an upward path and tightening path until July. And at that point, they will be looking to assess the macro impact. And the only question that we have, you know, we, we called it the third mistake. You know, so the first mistake was that they left it too late. The second mistake is that they raised too quickly. The third mistake will be that they have no choice but to cut, even though core inflation may not be down at their target levels. Um, and that is the, uh, the issue. You know, does core inflation come down fast enough before they have a large enough financial crisis that forces them to reverse course. Uh, so, you know, they'll want to keep that duration long and they will hope that they can do. And we did, we have seen in the past, you know, rates on hold for uh, a year or more. But um, my guess is that we're already seeing enough collateral damage within financial markets and particularly the non-financial, non-bank financials that, you know, thinking that we can have six more months with another 100 basis points of tightening is, um, is quite optimistic and QT at the same time. Very good answer. Thank you. That's terrific. Thank, thanks for that, Ian. It's awesome. Um, all right, let's take a little bit of a different tact here. Uh, we've been talking about a lot of uh, you know macro concepts, uh, but let's just talk about actual price action and what's actually going on in the markets. You know, it's the old line trade, what you see, not what you think. Um, we all have a lot of interesting theories up here, some of which turn out to be true and some of which don't, but it's certainly very compelling um, listening to Ian uh, rattle on, but I'm no better. But let's just talk about right here, right now. Sorry, uh, so, no, Ian, it's a compliment, my friend. So um, you know, it's funny. Uh, you, know, you, you can do this one of two ways. You can either you know, be a thinker, as you are, and hopefully uh, the charts and the price action bears you out, or you can trade what you see, not what you think, and then try to figure out why is it doing what it's doing and put a story with it. Um, there are a few people who have called the better market better than 
uh, Mr. Thornton of Hedge Fund Telemetry. Uh, Thomas, um, I know you had a webinar today, but as I was 30,000 feet over the Atlantic, I, uh, the connection was horrible. I couldn't listen in. So I know you had, you had a webinar going over shortage with uh, Jeff Garbaz. So, Tommy, uh, maybe just talk a little bit about, you know, what you're seeing, also how the webinar was and what your views are. Again, and, and, and Ian, uh, I'm, gonna, I'm teasing Tommy, I'm teasing you. You're both, like, great guys, but you're also, like, like normal. And so the funny thing is, just like Ian, you were, you know, wildly you know, out of character bearish this year. Well, Thornton, who likes to swing both ways, and he's, he's annoying as all hell because he calls his counter turn around as he's usually right. I freaking hate it when he does it, but he's usually right. Um, he, he actually is extremely bearish, like, as of a week or two ago. So, again, again, just like when you turn really bearish, Ian, I listen. When Tommy turns really bearish, I listen. So, with no further ado, Mr. Thornton, the floor is yours. Uh, thank you, George. Um, and hello to everyone. Yeah, today was a really important price action and it's the reason i say that is i've been really focused on the november 10th cpi report we had a big gap up and the market gapped up to let's just say s p 3900 and right around those levels there that was tested a few times uh, you know over the last month and we finally broke some levels today the nasdaq broke its level and uh so did the S and P. The S and P not as convincing, but I still think it's uh, there's some risk here. Um, the interesting thing is just looking or w- watching what happened after the November 10th CPI and this week's CPI. We had a massive gap up uh, in this week, and it, it reversed uh, pretty quickly. And it, I, you know, the good news is uh, I do think that inflation peaked and the uh, Inflation is coming down. I think there's too many people out there that think that inflation is plummeting. And it, there's a lot of sticky stuff in the inflation world that uh, will probably stay that way for a while. Um, you know, one thing also, just going, you know, a little, instead of just price action, the um, jobless claims came out really, really strong today. And I think that was overlooked. And it's important because the jobless claims are calculated on the 12th of every month. No, sorry, the non-farm payroll was, was calculated as well as the unemployment report this week. So the claims numbers are really low, you know, very, very low. Uh, I think you're going to have another uh, decent uh, jobs number on the beginning of the month. So that's something to watch. I think that will be a bearish um, situation. You know, not only did um, uh, S&P break 3,900, but the Euro stocks 50 did as well. And the price action in Europe uh, with the bond market uh, just going crazy and and equities dropping. Um, I, I think it's the first time that I've ever heard the ECB or someone from the ECB truly, truly hawkish. I mean, it, it, the ECB is like sort of a passive aggressive entity. They'll, they'll, you know, they'll sound hawkish, but while they're cutting rates. But today was like a very notable uh, meeting and, and Christine Lagarde, it definitely um, the tan Grinch, as I like to call her, uh, was as as Grinchy as it could be. And uh, so I think right now the, the the thing that we have no catalyst going forward uh, for the rest of the year. Liquidity is not good, uh, which could swing either way. But I don't see really any strong reason that anybody's going to want to put risk on heading into the holiday. I think there's only um, there's going to be more motivated sellers if we drift lower uh, because I think that there's still some tax loss selling people that are going to say oh, the hell with it uh, so I think that we, we're really into a void in right now we don't have uh, the buybacks those start to go into the blackout period uh, we have some key names that are really starting to break uh, Tesla obviously uh, well sorry I won't remember name the name uh, Apple looks, looks really weak uh, and another thing that I'm looking at is we had a lot of 20-day lows in the market today on a lot of different sectors, notably semiconductors. Uh, we had staples, I think that was it, uh, industrials, materials, a couple here, transports, tech, 
financials, retail, IWM, communications, uh, XLY, just discretionary. Uh, we had a ton of 20-day highs uh, just a week ago. So we've seen this really quick reversal. And that, to me, says that the, the market is really has run out of mojo and uh, sellers have pretty quick trigger fingers. Uh, really quick, just to, just in the yeah. interest of moderating the room, um, there are a lot of people requesting to ask questions. And so the people who are up here who don't have their hands up, if you do have your hand up, I won't knock you down. But if you don't, I might knock you down <laughs> so that other people can come up and ask questions. Go ahead. Okay. Continue. Okay. Tommy, um, sorry. So, you know, I, I think right now we're just sort of in a void. And if the market uh, breaks that level, going back for, with the CPI from November uh, 10th, uh, there's a, there are going to be a lot of trapped one month, um, in fact, uh, longs that are going to get motivated to sell. And I think that's just really the key that I'm watching right now uh, overall in the market. I think the bond market could rally a little bit more. And that's actually the, the difference between what we've seen, we haven't seen in all year, is I think that's a risk off move towards bonds. And uh, I think that could uh, that could continue for a little bit. Not I don't, I'm not like a big giant bond bull, but I think that uh, um, a little bit, uh, a little bit lower on rates, um, and then you know we'll see where we go. It, so, especially yeah, so going into the beginning of the year. Go on. All right, can I jump in with a few questions? Uh, just generally, um, as far as the short side is concerned, short interest. I mean, I know Jeff yeah. was talking about uh, a lot of people are covered, and you look at the short interest. You know, as a percentage of the average stock is pretty low. What sort of general comments can you make about about how the, how the, the, the short aspect of the market looks right now? Yeah, I'm oh, sorry. sorry, my ADD kicked in. Um, the, the interesting thing is, um, two weeks ago, uh, Jeff and I we do our bi monthly short interest uh, webinar, and I was blown away that the short intensity of the Erlanger research, which basically means, you know, if there are a lot of shorts, it's above fifty percent. If it's below, there's not a lot of shorts involved. Almost every sector was, well, every sector is below 50%. And it just said to me that, that shorts have been covering on every rip higher and are basically out of the market. We don't have a lot of shorts in this market. And it's quantifiable. It's not, you know, just made up stuff. It's really quantifiable that we don't have real short squeeze potential right now in the market. I think that it's also partly uh, due to the low exposures that a lot of hedge funds have right now. They, a lot of them, um, who was it? Uh, Lafont uh, from Kotu Co said that, you know, he's sitting in 70% cash. That's his hedge. You know, cash pays something now, so they don't have to need, they don't need tail risk. And that's why you see the VIX a bit, you know, not trading as you would expect with the markets so volatile. Nobody's buying tail risk options 30 days out. They're all buying the short dated, um, you know, zero data expiration stuff that they're trying to hit home runs uh, each day. It's what all the cool kids are doing. That's all I got to say. <laughs> okay, sorry about that. Um... Now let's get to um, Cramerica. He's been waiting forever. Oh, hey, guys. Thanks, Emma. Can you hear me? Yep. Yeah, uh, I'm amazed with the bear sentiment here. I'm just going to throw some statistics here and let us know what you guys think. Uh, over the last seven Fed rate hike cycles, the average return between the last hike and the rate pause was 15%. Uh, that already happened since uh, October. The average return between the rate pause and the start of a recession, which haven't happened yet. In fact, in the last seven hike cycles, there wasn't one where S&P was negative during that period. So by the time we get to the recession, historically speaking, we were never negative. And out of the last seven rate hike cycles, five ended with recessions, right? Uh, the average decline was like 30%. So I did some work, and it seems today is very similar to 1989, where employment was strong and infl inflation was pretty, pretty high. It was like 9%, 10%. The decline uh, of the S&P 500 at the time was 20%. So the difference between today 
uh, and back then is you have possible China reopening next year, right? Uh, possible uh, de-escalation of uh, Russia-Ukraine war. Uh, that that will help support the global economy next year. Uh, and by the way, even, even then, the 20% decline was only for five months. And the market rallied 22% after that. So maybe it won't be as bad as some of you might expect, right? Uh, on the other hand, also, you have M2 supply year over year lowest in a decade. It's like it's up like 1% year over year. And if we go to negative, then that won't be well for the treasury market, right? We already have bond investors asking every day about market liquidity here. So, and the repo market is scary. So if the Fed stops QT, it doesn't have to lower interest rates. If it only stops QT, money supply improves, that should help stocks as historically the correlation is perfect between S&P and the M2 supply year over year. Uh, just wondering what you guys think of this theory. Thank you. Who wants to take that one? Anybody? <laughs> uh, I I'll, don't... Say, I'll say something. Yeah. Uh, yeah. One of the strange yeah. things that's happened that um, Michael um, Cantro has talked about is that we really haven't seen earnings come down yet. Earnings estimates are still really high. Uh, and considering it's odd because we normally see when stocks come down real hard, um, earnings follow. Uh, so we haven't seen the earnings decline yet. We haven't seen some of the things that you typically see happen occur. So that to me is the, the concern is that we see another leg down uh, as earnings start to uh, weaken. And I think that one of the things that um, – you know, throw out the playbook from the last 10 years, because I don't think that uh, considering we have inflation, which we didn't have in the last 10 years, I don't think it's really, it's hard to equate what the Fed is going to do or what might they, what they might do. I think the Fed knows that they overstimulated. They've got a balance sheet that's gone from $9 trillion to $8.6, I think. That, that still has to come down. And, and maybe... Maybe they'll just keep QT going and just hold rates at the terminal rate for a while or, you know, in a year from now move to, you know, four, 400 basis points. I don't know. I think that it's just um, it, it, it's hard to tell at this point um, based off of any previous models because, again, inflation is a whole new um, situation that most of us have no clue Um some of the real you know problems that could occur and i think also the fed may have the same worries as well that's all but th those are good points and I, I respect what you what you just had to say i think that was uh those are fair points yeah i, I actually and you know I, I, no, ian you go ahead go ahead ian yeah so i think i i think that that is those are definitely the key things the thing that keeps me awake is whether we see the chinese um liquidity expand substantially enough in order to drive down the dollar um drive chinese growth up asian growth up for the rest of the world to start accelerating faster than the us is a key requisite for the dollar to come down and that dollar coming down is a sign that global liquidity is expanding I think the the problem with the narrative about um, you know the uh, that the inflation coming down and particularly say something like the the Ukraine situation resolving, although you'll get a short term boost, the the relationship between changes in energy prices and e activity in equity markets tends to be about eighteen months. So there's actually quite a long lag. The second thing is I don't believe the immaculate deflation narrative whereby inflation comes down and suddenly everything is great. Because actually, and, and a point to, I think, Michael Cantro's, you know, would, would, and I agree on, on, on this about the earnings, inflation coming down. So at the moment, you know, the, the positive narrative is that, in, you know, inflation being high, nominal growth being strong is holding up earnings. What we're now hearing is people saying, well, you know, when inflation comes down, real growth will start picking up. The problem is that nominal sales will start coming down. Nominal costs will remain constant. And at that point, margins get absolutely crushed. So, you know, this idea that it's a painless deflation or disinflation, 
I think is 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 a dangerous narrative. Yes, real income growth may go up, but inflation normally only comes down because unemployment's gone up. But that impact on the nominal value of sales for equities and for companies when they've got very high nominal costs is going to be the real issue here, George, that I, I would just caution against. Sorry, Emma. So, no, no. So I just wanted to say one thing about that. Um, I agree with everything you said, uh, except for when you get to the point where margins do get squeezed and then you probably see some layoffs and some more, some unemployment. Right. And then you could see, um, you know, a dis that you, that you could see disinflationary pressures from people not being able to pay their debt, you know, failing on their car loans or their, their mortgages, what have you, a type of deflationary bust if, if it was that bad. But um, like, yeah, that, I, I, you know what I'm I saying? Agree. Okay. Yeah. And, you know, the point that we're, the point that we're making to people is that, that, you know, terming out your debt doesn't help if you haven't got any income. Yeah. You know, uh, you know, debt instability is about, you know, it's always about income shock. It's not about interest rates. It's not about the term of your debt. It's about can you afford to pay that debt today? Uh, and and that's where unemployment going up hurts, hurts the real economy. Yeah, I, 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 I'd like to have a, a stab at it, and then I want Cantor to speak. Um, some really good points by the speaker, by the question that we've questioner, but I couldn't disagree with couldn't disagree more. Um, to compare, I mean, you go first of all. I think a little bit off on the numbers. Inflation only got up to six and change in uh, 1990, 1991. Much different situation. Fueled uh, in part by the huge increase in the price of oil. But that's where it ends. And going on some of the points Ian was making, it kind of echoes a lot of what uh, Vincent Delaward, uh, who was in this space a month ago, uh, who I heard speak again last week try to understand where inflation is going you have to understand how we got to where we got to and the three big drivers of the great moderation cheap energy cheap labor and cheap goods those things have all either stopped or are going in reverse you know 30 years ago we still had i think it was 20 million barrels of excess production capacity in energy we have virtually none now in the u.s the unemployment rate is at 50-year lows. Seven million people have dropped out of the labor force, and they're not coming back. Supply chains are in the process. It takes a long time for this to happen, but you know, onshoring of stuff is inflationary. Green energy is inflationary. So, so this sort of simple Wall Street average nonsense is is it just misses the point. And Cantro is going to make me sound like a piker when he starts getting into the particulars, in particular what the Fed did with liquidity and, and reliquifying the system. So I could not disagree more with the point that was made by the speaker. I'm sorry I got it's not like I have an attitude, but I do because it's just wrong. It's just flat out wrong. Cantro, over to you. Michael, are hey, you there? Yep, yep. Hey, George, can you hear me? Yeah, go for it. Um, yeah, just yeah, I'd caution against. You nailed it using averages, you know, especially when we have a small sample and that, that just gets so overdone and abused on Wall Street. Um, and it's just, you know, and then people are wrong and they wonder why it's because you took an N of seven things uh, and, you know, your eighth outcome didn't didn't exactly happen. And of course, if you're looking at seven and look at the average, that's all in sample. So it's not really a model. Um Regarding the Fed, here, I'll give you another fun stat. I think the gentleman who just spoke said, you know, at the last seven times the Fed has hiked. Well, somebody, I, I guarantee someone in this room got a, uh, yeah, Mr. Cray America, uh, got a piece of research or saw a piece of research when the Fed started hiking and said, look, over the last seven rate hikes, on average, stock markets go up a lot when the Fed is tightening. And that is absolutely true on average. The problem with both that and also I think the point Cromerica was making is that the Fed is only one of the cycles that we need to pay attention to. We need to pay attention to the profit cycle. We need to pay attention to the, you know, now, you know, the inflation cycle, the employment cycle. There's a lot of different cycles. You've got to think of all of them in context, uh, in the same context. And you have to look at all of them uh, together. 
So the reason why on average stocks go up when the Fed is tightening, because on average, where I'll give you the specifics, five out of the last seven, so more than half of Fed tightening cycles prior to this one started at a period where the economy was actually reaccelerating. Uh, in simple terms, when the PMIs were at 50 and going to 65 over the first year of tightening. So, of course, the market was going up because the economy was getting better and earnings estimates are ripping higher when uh, whenever PMIs are moving higher. Again, going back to stock prices. So, you know, the problem is t- today or this year, we started at the peak of the profit cycle in terms of uh, the Fed tightening, which is why stocks have performed horribly. So just, you know, I I like to say, you know, George, we're all trying to coin different things. I like yours, George. I like to say the analysis of averages produces average analysis at best. And Cantor, would it also be fair to say you're like the other way of looking at it, the way the first gentleman mentioned it is kind of like the backwards way, because, you know, when the economy was accelerating, that's why the Fed started hiking. And then and so it was really accelerating economy like causes Fed to hike and then it comes down. Like, it, like the causality is kind of backwards. Well, I mean, yeah, the Fed's always going to be reacting. You know, the Fed typically hikes because of inflation and they cut because of employment. Uh, I know Ian made a big point about that, and that's absolutely true. Um, I think the way the way we think about the Fed tightening cycle, which I haven't seen many people do. You know, you, you can look at all the charts uh, and see, you know, what happens when the Fed's done with the market. Um, but it's, it's, I think it's really simple. Uh, and I don't mean to sound naive or condescending, but there's two outcomes after every Fed tightening cycle. And if you go back, I think there's about 12 tightening cycles going back to 1960. You know, so as far back as it's relevant, you, you, know, you can go back further, but it's, I don't think it, the relevance kind of weakens. And there's only been four soft landings following a Fed tightening cycle. There's been seven or eight recessions. Uh, So whatever that number is, you know, 11 or 12. So, and each one of those four soft landings, and it's a sample of four, but when you have such a small sample, what you want to look for is consistency to have, you know, give it two things, consistency and common sense, because that'll give you a little more, I think, belief into what you're seeing or at least the validity of a smaller sample if it's all telling you the same thing and all four of these say the show the exact same thing um and they all happen for the same exact reason so the four the four times the fed tightened stopped and no recession followed the last one which most people remember was 2019 there was no recession after the fed was done in 2018 uh the economy was clearly rebounding on every leading metric uh, beginning in as early as January of 2019. And then it just got more and more clear. US, Both US and Europe were recovering well into and before COVID. And so when the Fed is done, the four soft landings you've had, in each one of those housing bottomed within a month or two of the Fed being done. And when, you know, so everyone's debating, is it a soft landing? Is it a hard landing? Let's define a landing because everyone's got definitions. The only consistent landing that I found is when housing bottoms, because housing is bo- housing bottoms at every landing, whether it's soft or hard, recession, or those four examples like in 2019. So if we're heading into recession, we'll know because when the Fed is done, or at least there's, there's many things we can look at, but I'll, I'll end here. When the Fed is done, when you're going into recession, housing keeps getting worse and it, and it keeps getting worse because employment starts to fall apart. And, and, you know, so, you know, I don't think you need to look at a million different things in GDP and break it down by a hundred different metrics. Mm-hmm. It's real simple. Housing, employment, profit expectations, credit. Hope. <laughs> well, but, hey, Cantor, would you say that you, that we are kind of going into a recession or is it, is that what you would, where, where you'd, place us right now or i don't think we're in a recession but there's been three specific uh ingredients that have preceded every recession going back again to 1950 um and in the four soft landings over that period we only had one of those three 
the one in every, in all of these examples is the Fed tightening, right? So the Fed tightens, you know, you're about, you're obviously at risk of a recession, at least historically, you're at greater than 50% risk of recession. But the reason you have a recession, it's not just because the Fed tightens, because otherwise you would have Fed tightening cycles lead to recession every time. And that's not true. What I have found to be the biggest, clearest differentiator of whether that Fed tightening cycle goes into recession or not, and this should sound pretty simple, is whether or not you've had a broad-based rise of inflation, specifically a shock to food and energy. The four times, including 2018, 1994, 1985, and 1966, those four, le- four, four soft landings, there was no inflation, like 2 to 3%. We hit 22% this year. We hit about 15% in 07. Uh, and so the third one is banks that, that are tightening lending standards. So prior to the 1990 recession, which, you know, I, you know, which was definitely kind of kicked over the edge by oil prices as we were about to invade the Persian Gulf and ended with oil prices peaking essentially uh, in early 1991, you had those three conditions. You had high, high, higher than 5% food and energy inflation. You had a Fed that was tightening and you had banks that were tightening lending standards. The only times in history since then we've had that was 2000. 2007 and eight and today. Gotcha. That's gotcha. That's yeah. great. That, that's great, Michael. Just stay there. I'm sure you have a lot of follow-up questions. Uh, ALB, fly when... angry. He's been waiting forever. Okay. Go for it. Um, hello. Thank you for having me. Um, I'm kind of young and I'm just getting in all this stuff. And I was wondering if y'all have any like resources that I should check out. Um, to start learning and whatnot. Um, yeah, you, you know, uh, what, if you could send me a DM offline, I'd be happy to help you on that. Uh, in deference to the sixteen hundred other people in the room, I, I, I think we should discuss that offline. So, Likewise. thanks for the th- thank. Yeah, d- yeah, yeah. DM Emma or myself. Great question. Uh, happy to help. Uh, I'd rather do that offline. Uh, Albie, you had something you want to follow up? Albie, the floor is yours. Yeah, I just wanted to follow up on what Ian said because he mentioned a very important point, which happens to be. The uh, the creditors' ability to service the debt. I mean, obviously, okay, the uh, the funding costs can go down, but at the same time, uh, you have to maintain a positive cash flow. In other words, you have you know you have to be profitable. You have to be able to generate an income so that you can eventually uh, be able to service the debt. Now, the issue is if you look at the because anybody who's anybody is familiar with uh, how the monetary system operates you would understand that in order for the private sector to generate, I mean, to have a, to have a profit, the public sector would generate, I mean, it needs to run a deficit. I mean, you can't create something out of nothing. The state is the sole issue of the one thing that is required for the payment of taxes, which happens to be, you know, the currency. Uh, if you look at the fiscal spending that we had in 2021, we moved from a 2.7 trillion deficit to a 1.3 trillion deficit in 22. So in other words, the spending, the net income that went towards the economy got cut in half. This will effectively affect the private sector ability to service the existing debt. And that takes time to materialize. And uh, pro- between, six to, between six to 12 months, uh, which is why I've been on the bearish camp it's in the beginning of the year, but I just wanted to follow that uh, you know, with the uh, with what Ian said. Albie, it's a great point. We now we look at monetary contraction, but you're looking at fiscal consolidation as well. Ian, I, I know you have an opinion on that. Way in, Ian, please. Ian, did no, you? Want- I was, I, yeah, no, I was just I was just you know saying very much so. You know that you know we you know, the the only way that you're going to get out of this is when you see fiscal and monetary easing at the same time and you know that is going to be you know essential to you know to to uh, unfortunately stabilize the long run global economy but uh you know you get need to get that balance back but at the moment you know we're definitely not going there and the kind of fiscal orthodoxy and monetary orthodoxy that we're seeing is is a route to uh, to to major stress in our view 100% um so Emma, I know. I think Mike, if you could, uh, Michael Kramer. I know you're out there. I would love to hear from you. Uh, I know you're in the audience. Please raise your hand so Emma can bring you up. Uh, if anyone was on stage, uh, 
is not going to speak again, please uh, stand down from the stage because we've got a big stage and we want to get some others up here. Um, I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to head off now. So thank you very right. much, everybody. I, Cheers, I, George. Thanks, Emma. Ian, this has been fabulous. Thank um, you, Ian. So, uh, Mike Burning Theta. Is that Mike Kramer? I'm not sure. Is that is that you? No, a different Mike. Sorry, Mike. I, just... I didn't give him a speaker invite. Yeah, so, so did I as well. Sorry, let's try to keep this in order. Um, I'd like for Nostradamus, Nostra House of Dumbass, the best name on Twitter. Um, if he, uh, I'd love to hear your thoughts. I always like hearing you speak. Nostra, son, son of Dumbass, the floor is yours. Please unmute yourself, Nostra. Can you hear us? I think he's in the, he's, he moved to listener. Hold on, I sent him an invite. Yeah, he's on, he's on speaker, but all right. Uh, and again, we got a bit, okay, we got Porter. Hey, Porter, good to see you. What's up, man? What are you thinking? Hey, George. Uh, first of all, I just love, love your spaces. You guys had some great guests on it. I really thought that uh, uh, the, the one, the, the, uh, the Tesla one with, uh, with uh, Gordon was fantastic a couple weeks ago. I really, really enjoyed just the, the fundamental uh, dive in, into Tesla and solar. It was a uh, real, uh, real great spaces. Anyway. I actually want to talk a little bit with Cantro about the housing. And, you know, I really didn't think housing was in a bubble up until COVID. And, you know, you, you, when they took the rates essentially to zero, existing home sales exploded and, of course, price exploded, right? And we went through this super normal bubble. Uh, and if you look back to what happened in 06, you know, through 2012, you know, the, the, the housing market really, you know, crashed out in, you know, six, seven, eight, nine. And it took four years to recover. And that's with slashing rates to zero. And, you know, and, you know, we've had all these guys looking for the pivot, the pivot, the pivot. You know, it just seems to me that this thing is going to take so much longer than people think it is. And it's just going to be a lot more painful because, you know, the, at least at that point that, you know, the Fed was, you know, at one point they, they, they realized the system was collapsing and they, they cut rates to zero. But here we have an inflation problem and I don't think we can do that. And so I just I just think this cycle is going to be a lot. It's going to be a lot more like water torture and it's going to last for a lot longer than people think it is. And so, especially from the, from the housing perspective, I'm just curious of your take, Kendra, on this. Yeah, I was thinking, actually, as I think George was starting with Emma, you know, the never using, we haven't done our outlook call. We're going to do it the first week of the uh, year in January. Uh, something like the never ending story, or just put a picture of Falcor, for those of you that are uh, at least 40, uh, will know that <laughs> reference. Um, so with with regards to housing, you know, specifically when I talk about housing, I'm talking about the leading indicators of housing. And some of them are somewhat, you know, sentiment measures or diffusion measures. Uh, others are obviously building permits and housing starts. So in 09, uh, and I would say at least 50% of institutional investors, when I speak to them about this, and they said, well, housing didn't buy them in 09. Uh, sure it did. Uh, the NHB index, which is builder sentiment, but which is a function of current home sales, uh, current traffic, and expected home sales over the next six months, hit a low in January of 08, uh, sorry, January of 09. Housing starts hit a low in March of 09, or they may have ticked up in March of 09. I don't have it right in front of me. But basically, those two indicators bottomed uh, in the first quarter, along with PMIs and, of course, eventually the market, once we understood what FAS 157 was going to mean for banks' balance sheets. So in, obviously, in 2009, 2010, 11, consumers got crushed in the U.S. because there was no wage growth, um, still had you know, high levels of unemployment that started coming, you know, that came down from a high level, at least. And then you had China goosing the global economy and pushing commodities back up to all-time highs uh, really quickly, and even some countries like the ECB and others raising rates. So it was a real, yeah, those two years are kind of a weird period, uh, I think, or should go back down as a weird period. Yes, the NBER said the recession ended in June of, uh, June of 09. I would say, you know, we really didn't get housing, while, while it bottomed in 09, it really didn't recover until 2012, 
and and there thereafter everything kind of started firing in all cylinders in the U.S. So, yeah, that's I don't know if that's getting a little more in the weeds, but I, I agree with what you're saying because again, I 100 percent you know you really didn't have to take off in housing uh, until 2012. And you could argue housing was in a double dip recession after 2011's downturn. But, like, but from, yeah, in this perspective, in this case, you know, like house prices haven't even started to correct yet. Right. And, and so you, you, we haven't even yeah. gone through the cycle of, of correcting. And, you know, given where rates are, house prices have got to correct 30, at least 30 percent all over the place. And I don't think yeah. people are really prepared for that. I agree. I mean, we, we look at various different affordability metrics. Um, that are very different than this, the classic median income to median home price stuff. Um, we look at consumer sentiment or the perception of housing affordability, which is also a more equal weighted, broader way to do it. That it's not skewed by any specific area of the country or any specific income cohort. Um, and that last month fell to two <laughs> out of a, you know, it's, it's at the two percentile. Um, basically it was only lower once in 1981 or 1982 uh, before, before, you know, everything uh, or before the 82 recession or 81 recession. Um, it, I think it, how, how quickly housing recovers is going to be a somewhat path dependent on how slow or how sharp this downturn is, right? The sharper the downturn, the more quickly we'll get rates down, some stimulus, uh, inflation down, the labor market down, and that'll give you, at least a, an earlier reprieve or if let's say we get a recession, but it doesn't start until 2024, well then the next 12 months are just going to feel like we're, you know, kind of walking in slow motion down downhill until eventually we hit that, which, which, you know, going back to George's point about time uh, I agree, man, times time. we got a lot of time left in this. Uh, I think we're only in the second or third inning of the earnings decline. Um, but to me, you know, it's real simple. You got to get home prices down a lot. You got to get interest rates down a lot, or you got to get income up a lot. The, la- the latter is not going to happen. Or that would take one hell of a long time to get affordability up just through income. Um, so the most likely best case scenario is, uh, you know, we, we, we see a, a pretty uh, big cyclical hit that allows us to recover. Um, because if rates don't come down, housing is going to be at best an L-shaped recovery which is going to make the economy kind of get a kind of a weak, weak, weak period of growth. Maybe it's not recession, but it's just kind of going nowhere fast. No, great. I really appreciate it. I, I, I happen to agree. I, you know, I, I, I wish I wasn't so bearish, but the fundamentals all suck. I mean, that, that that's one, one of your four stools. Yep. You know, ha, and, uh, all, autos, autos suck. Uh, Same thing with affordability there. At least those well, those are coming down. And just want to be want, want to say one thing because people you, like to love to throw housing stocks in my face. Uh, and again, I'm, I'm, I'm I don't reference housing stocks when I'm talking about a hope framework um, because yes, while they're one and the same, they're also two very different. Why are housing stocks up thirty percent today? Because investors are playing a pivot rally, a fantasy. Why are why were housing stocks up in June, July, and August? Exactly thirty percent as well. Same reason. You know what? Last time before that, housing stocks were up 30% when the Fed was done in June 06. Everyone go back and look at ITB, Lennar, DH Horton, pick your housing stock. From June of 06 to Feb 07, housing stocks ripped 35% and then went went to zero effectively or close to it. Yeah. So uh, don't what, read what are the things that we look at? Yeah. One of the things that we look at for the health of the consumer is is, is the credit cards, right? And we can look at charge offs, you can look at all this sort of stuff. But when you look at the, the growth of credit card debt, look at Cap One's uh, monthly data. The, the growth is twenty percent. Like th- that's a you know the last form of of uh, liquidity people have is credit card debt, and it's growing twenty percent annualized. It's just a horrible metric. It just really is. You know, if people have to tap, you know, twenty five percent interest rates to 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 make it. I mean, it's just it's a horrible situation. So, I don't think the consumer is in a good place. And you know, we 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 you know we just talked about how housing is about to fall. You know, at least you know twenty percent car sales down too. So, I don't think the the economy is you know headed to a good place right now. 
Yeah, great. And, you know, the pushback against the consumer is, oh, there's so much money there. They have good balance sheets. But then why are they borrowing so much? Yeah. And banks are tightening lending standards on consumer credit cards for the first time since uh, a long time, uh, last recession. Uh, so, yeah, I agree. Um, things are not as good as they seem. And, uh, you know, again, we look at aggregates and, you know, you really need to get down to the details to see where the strength or weakness is coming from. At the end of the day, it's all about rates of change. It's not about how strong you are or weak you are. It's are you getting stronger or weaker? And that is what markets trade off of. And I don't see anything getting stronger going forward. Terrific. Uh, Carter, do you uh, you had a follow-up? Carter, unmute yourself. Yeah, hey, Mike. Um, I just had a quick question on housing, housing services, inflation, and how you think about that. Um, my guess is that the doves on the FOMC would probably back off just if housing prices sort of level out. Have you done, have you done much of an analysis on what that would, what that would mean for housing services inflation? And would that, would that be at risk of coming back uh, kind of reaccelerating higher maybe in 24? Uh, was this going specifically to like OER rent? You mean? The or, just the the housing services or just the broad, component or just the, the year over year rate of change. Yeah, I mean it's a lagging indicator. Powell's already talked about it numerous times now. So that coming down, you know, all these all these you know, durable good, goods is coming down clearly. Uh, energies had come down. We'll see where that goes. Foods 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 coming down. Airlines are coming down. Transportation is coming down. So all these things we know. Great. All, all of the discussion around inflation, in my opinion, and I think Powell said it yesterday numerous times, is going to boil back down to inflation. So, like, I think people are going to have going to blow their heads off over the next five months trying to decipher all these different aspects of inflation. At the end of the day, it's the 50 and he said it multiple times, the 55 percent of, of core PCE is services, core services which is predominantly a reflection of uh, services employment inflation, which um, is still red hot right now. Uh, Nick, Nick uh, Timoros had a couple of tweets or a bunch of tweets yesterday, and I tried to engage him. He just gave me a like, but I showed the chart of ISM services prices Yep, at 70 today, Yep, which is outside of the last two years is a record high. It only goes back to 98. Hey, 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 a definitional question. I can't think of anyone better answer this question than you. It's the same, the same wheelhouse, same sandbox. What is that from the Atlanta Fed? They got that sticky inflation index. Do you know what that thing is? It's, uh, I don't have the definition in front of me. It's a subset of CPI measures. Uh, so it's not the whole thing. There's something else. I don't know if it's still published, but it was called the Everyday Index. And I forgot who published it. I don't know if it was the New York Fed. Um, but I don't know, George, off the top of my head, exactly what that is. Yeah. Even I have, I haven't no, gotten yeah. that much into it. You know, I'm, 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 I didn't mean the question. It's literally, actually, I'm, I'm sorry, it was, but in, it, it's an index created by the um, Reserve Bank of Atlanta. Um, it measures the rate of stickiness among consumer prices. So basically, oh, okay, sorry. Um, yeah, it's a, it's a CPI and takes um, into account how quickly rates adjust and changes of uh, in overall economy. You know what? That's actually a great segue to Michael Howell. Just when you thought this room couldn't get any better, uh, between Porter and Cantro, um, we had one fellow from that um, island with the bad weather and the rain being replaced by another one now. So, Mr. Howell, good evening. It's past your bedtime. It's 11.30 p.m. in London. But um, you gave a tremendous tour de force a week or two ago. We were in the space together. Curious on um, any updated thoughts, and, and also maybe this this question of persist, inflation persistence. Because I remember one of your recent presentations, you had something in there, some indicator which showed it wasn't just the overall inflation rate, but it showed the the, the stickiness of it from one month to the next. Maybe that'd be a good, be a good place to start. Yeah, hi, hi, George. Uh, thanks. Um, on the inflation front, I mean, I, my view is that inflation is coming back. I think that uh, given the inflection or the limited inflection we've seen in the economy so far, uh, the extent to which inflation has come back has been actually quite a surprise. So that may tell you that as we shift into recession, you're going to get quite a tumble in, in inflation measures. 
And I'm very much in, still in the disinflationary camp. And I think that's what's coming. My view is that uh, what we're looking at is more volatile inflation over the next few years. So I think we're going to get spikes up and spikes down. And that's the new way of living. But I just want to step back because I think the, the, the big issue out there is not really in the inflation one, which clearly everyone has been focusing on near term. There's a much, much bigger elephant in the room. And that bigger elephant is the fiscal situation and the deteriorating fiscal situation, not just in the U.S., but worldwide. Um, the U.S. actually is kind of the, the cleanest shirt, shirt in the laundry here, but there's still a big problem out there. And the numbers look daunting insofar as there's deficits or there's bond issuance of about $2 trillion a year to finance. Now, therein lies the story, because what I was saying last week or the week before in your spaces was that my view of the next uh, 12 months at least is that we've just passed the point of maximum tightness. Uh, liquidity conditions, which is what we focus on, uh, are going to start to pick up quite noticeably next year. That doesn't mean I'm bullish on the market. I'm not. The next six months are going to be really quite tough. But I think there is some light at the end of the tunnel. I just want to say why. OK, if you look at what drives global liquidity, there are four factors to take into account, four boxes to tick. Number one of those is clearly the Fed, and I'm going to come to that last. The other three are the People's Bank of China, which has started to ease clearly because of the effects of the lockdown uh, or the, uh, the, the damage the lockdowns have done. And basically, the PBOC is starting to inject in liquidity uh, at a rate you haven't seen for probably 18 months. So it's not going to be like 2008, where they just goosed the system hugely. This is a, a more moderate change, but it's positive. The second thing is the oil markets have come back and oil is a really intensive user of liquidity that will release liquidity back into uh, financial markets. So another tick. Third thing is the dollar. There's a huge amount of credit, which is dollar linked. And as the dollar comes back, uh, you get almost a one for one increase in uh, cross border dollar lending. So we've had a 7% fall in the dollar. Uh, it's going to definitely kick liquidity conditions up uh, in dollar loan markets in the next 12 months. Uh, so all these things are saying we're probably around the bottom or passing the bottom in the global liquidity cycle. But it's the fourth one I want to focus on because that is the most contentious in terms of what's going on. And that's what the Fed is doing. In the last seven weeks, six of those weeks, the Federal Reserve has basically uh, reduced its balance sheet by selling treasuries. In five of those seven weeks, the Fed has injected liquidity into the system. Uh, and that is the paradox. And I think what we've got to increasingly do is to separate out the interest rate policy from the Federal Reserve, which is focused on inflation. And as a result of that, I don't believe they're going to let rates fall very quickly. And the other one is the liquidity policy of the Federal Reserve, which I think is going up. And that is the, the dilemma or the paradox in all this in this situation. If the Fed does that, you're going to see uh, liquidity conditions improve quite markedly next year. In other words, the P.E. goes up, uh, but the E, I think, craters. And that's the dilemma. It's very much like 2001. In 2001, the Fed began to ease in the early part of the year. The stock market didn't bottom for 18 months. Um, the corporate credit market was the first one really to lift off of the risk markets. And that was at the back end of 2001. And that's the bit I'd be looking at now uh, for any hint of a move. Uh, the Treasury market, as it happened, gave a decent performance in 2001, but it wasn't gangbuster. And I think that's what we're looking at next year. Let me just finish just very briefly on why I think the Federal Reserve is doing this. What happened in September in the British gilt market, the sovereign market in the UK, uh, was turmoil. And the policymakers were spooked by that. The policymakers, not just in Britain, but in the US and worldwide. And they cannot let the sovereign debt markets go. So they've tried to stabilize them. And if you look at what's happened in the U.S. Treasury market on our metrics since September, market liquidity in the Treasury market from the low point has tripled. And that has been coincident with the Federal Reserve allowing liquidity to come back into the market, into the money markets. As I say, the Federal Reserve in the last few weeks has injected over $100 billion back into the markets. Uh, and that's, I think, something to start thinking about because it's not the, the traditional narrative. P multiples may go up or get support. Yield curves are going to steepen next year. But the E is toast for the moment. 
and the Federal Reserve has done too much and probably realises it's done too much. And I think you're getting a lot of screams of pain out of the private equity sector right now uh, because that's the bit that may be getting hit. And I'm sure Jay Powell is getting calls from his pals there to say, you've done enough. Start to uh, turn the tap back on. So just my- quick, just, sorry, go ahead. No, go ahead. Go ahead. Go ahead. Just a quick question, Heid Sphinx. Just a quick question. You mentioned this all happening in the backdrop of a greater global fiscal deterioration, which, you know, we know the decrease in global demand for, for goods and services, you know, which has led to this decrease in GDP growth and a decrease in um, government revenues. Can you co- link that to what you just said with the Fed? Yeah, because I think that what you I think what we're seeing is we're moving towards fiscal dominance and we're seeing this kind of worldwide. And the first, you know, everything that we've experienced in the last 20 years has been baked in Japan first, uh, whether it's QE, whether it's negative interest rates, whether it's yield curve control, whether it's deflation. All these factors have basically been experienced by the Japanese. They've invented all these tools. Uh, you know, they started QE. Everyone else has followed. We're going to start seeing yield curve control happening uh, increasingly over uh, the next few years. And this may be an example of that in, you know, a slightly subtle guise. Uh, you know, the, the the British are doing it. They've switched from uh, QT to QE with alacrity overnight when there was turmoil in the in the bond markets. The ECB is paring back its some of its, uh, you know, slated withdrawal of liquidity. So I think a lot of these governments are getting very, very concerned because they know they've got to sell an awful lot of debt. And if you start to sell debt at high interest rates, you've, you've got a problem. Uh, you just get into a debt spiral. So they need to control yields. And I think what they're doing is trying to stabilize the sovereign debt markets. Now, I could be completely wrong, but then, you know, hey, someone can explain to me why you've had, uh, you know, this, this paradox where the Federal Reserve can have its cake and eat it by principally saying, look, we're doing QE, Q, T guys, we're letting treasuries roll off the balance sheet, but behind the scenes, we're doing an unofficial QE, so to speak, because we're allowing liquidity conditions uh, in the money markets to rise. And I think the key thing that comes out of this is what you've got to watch is the level of bank reserves. Um, you know, bank reserves are getting down to de minimis levels, a, 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 you know, close to the levels of what the Federal Reserve would deem to be adequate reserves. And that could be uh, easily a problem. And I think, you know, alongside you're starting to get uh, uh, some of the bank CEOs uh, being spooked by the recession because they're starting to say things that, um, you know, among the the CIOs in the U.S., they've been some of the most outspoken about saying that a recession is coming. Well, if they are saying a recession is coming, they probably know a lot more about it than uh, the most other companies. Uh, They can probably see it. So I think you've got bad news. And I would suspect the Federal Reserve is starting to get concerned now. And the last thing I would just add to that is that global trade tensions and currency volatility certainly doesn't help the equation. Thank you. I have a question for um, for Michael uh, Cross Border. Um, but can, can you speak to what your thoughts are on uh, the the Japanese yen and the coming um, switching out of Corona and like what are your expectations? for April of next year, or, or, or do you have, I mean, nobody's got a crystal ball, but just curious. Well, I'm, I'm sure that's right. But I think the, you know, the, the situation is, I think the yen, I think the, I think first of all, the, the dollar is coming back. I don't think dramatically, but I think we're in a, uh, from the peak, the dollar may come down by about 15, 20%. I mean, we're probably, you know, in truth, seven, eight percent down on that already. So uh, the dollar's coming back. The yen is likely to be a beneficiary of that. Uh, the reason being is that the Japanese have been running uh, a relatively successful yield curve control policy. They don't seem to be deviating from that. But ultimately, others are beginning to catch up now. So if the Federal Reserve is, uh, as we suggest, beginning to ease liquidity or starting that process, Japan doesn't look so much of an outlier. And you've got a you've got a good case for the yen to rebound. Um, if the dollar is coming off, you may get Japanese institutions pulling money back uh, into Japan. So I would suspect that the yen could be a decent beneficiary and it may well move right back to its PPP, which is about 125. So I, I'd, be looking at, I'd be looking at that. Uh, the health of the, Jap- of the Japanese economy, ultimately, at the end of the day, uh, you know, dare we say, really depends more and more on China. And if the China, Chinese economy picks up, I'm, I'm not bullish on China. 
uh, on the economy medium term, but I do think it's going to have a cyclical bounce.